Does anybody have any questions about the homework assignment that's due tonight before we get started? Okay, so one thing that I just want to say about the entity assignment quickly because um, maybe this wasn't 100% clear uh, from last time. I've gotten a few questions about this from this group and from my other COMP2 class. Um, one way that you know that you're looking at an enthymeme and not just something that is, you know, that it contains some implied symbolism is that an enthymeme always makes a claim. Right? There's always an argument embedded in it. It's always trying to persuade you of something. Right? The means it's using to do so are not always obvious. Right? That's where the whole implied thing comes in. But if we think back uh, to that first example I gave you um, last week, right? A bigger burger is a better is a better burger. The burgers are better at burger. The burgers are bigger at Burger King, right? The thing it's trying to convince you of is what's implied, right? That the burgers are better at Burger King because they're bigger. Remember, an enthymeme is always going to be trying to convince you of something. This is one of the reasons I suggested one of the places you might look is at advertisements, right? Because an ad, by its very nature, is trying to persuade you to buy shit that you don't need. So that's the big test, right? When you are looking at something and trying to decide whether or not this is an enthymeme or not, right? Does it make a claim? And one of the reasons I wanted you to do this assignment for today in particular is because we are going to be discussing the relationship between claims and evidence today, right? So I have a couple of quotes from some old Sherlock Holmes stories uh, that I want to think about a little bit. Or that I want you to think about. I've already thought about them. So we're going to start with a quote from The Crooked Man in which Holmes makes an observation about his assistant, Dr. Watson's behavior. Watson is surprised by this, and Holmes then just explains, like, look, man, it's just a simple observation, right? So Holmes has noticed that Watson must be, he's observed that Watson must be very busy. And Watson has asked him, well, how can you tell? Holmes says, right, I have the advantage of knowing your habits, my dear Watson, said he. When your round is a short one, you walk, and when it is a long one, you use a hansom. Does everybody know what a hansom is? None of you know what a hansom is. Okay, so a hansom is a horse-drawn carriage, right? So essentially, when he's busy, Watson, you know, does the uh, Victorian equivalent of taking a cab, right? Rather than simply walking. As I perceive that your boots, although used, are by no means dirty, I cannot doubt that you are at present busy enough to justify the handsome, right? So by noticing that Watson's feet aren't dirty, Holmes can make the claim that Watson is at present very busy because he's observed his habits, right? The basic idea here right, is that how do you come to conclusions like, how are you able to make claims about really anything at all? Where do you generate those claims? Where do they come from? Close observation, right? And everybody understands what the distinction is, right, between claim and evidence. Yeah, what is a, what is a claim? When I talk about a claim, what, am I, what do I mean? Something somebody says is true. Something that someone says is true, some, that, someone wants to, that someone wants me to believe is true. Right? Is a claim a statement that is true on its own? No. No, a claim requires something to back it up, right? So a claim really is any statement 
that is not sort of independently verifiable, right? It's not something like, I can just look up whether this is true or not um, on the internet or whatever, right? Although the internet would give me uh, all sorts of answers as to whether or not it was true. But I digress. Now, so what, what's evidence and what, ev what relationship does evidence bear to claim? Verify. Yeah, evidence is essentially verifiable fact, right, observed data. And yeah, on the one hand, like if you're reasoning deductively, then evidence is what you use to prove or justify a claim, right? If you are reasoning inductively, evidence is what you use to generate a claim. So what Holmes has actually done here is reasoned inductively, right? He has observed something about Watson's habits and the state of his boots, and used that to come to, an, to a conclusion about how busy his assistant is in his medical practice, right? Most of the reasoning you are gonna have to do on assignments for this class and for others is gonna be inductive, right? You're gonna be given sets of data, sets of evidence, and you are gonna have to come up with your own questions and answers about them, right? You are gonna have to generate claims about them. All right, so let me give you another example. This is from um, a story called The Copper Beaches. So give this a read and tell me what the claim is here and what the evidence is. Just speak up once you feel like you've got either. Okay, yeah, the claim, yes, yeah, the crime is actually worse in the country than it is in the city, right? Yeah, good, okay. And then he provides evidence by saying, like, how things are in the city, and then down at the bottom, he talks about in the countryside, uh, people are ignorant of the law, and okay. it's at all clusters well, Is it the law that makes people behave in the city? No. Yeah, exactly. It's simply because there are people around everywhere, right? So the pressure of conforming to social good graces, right? And the fact that it's difficult, more difficult for a crime to go undiscovered are, um, in the city makes people behave better, right? Whereas he reasons that not only are poor ignorant, there are poor ignorant folk who know little of the law in the country, that's actually a pretty condescending attitude, right? Um, but also, because there are fewer people around, it's easier to do shit and not get caught. All right, so. Whenever you are faced with any kind of writing project, right, you are going to have to make clear determinations as to which of the statements in your own work and your source's work constitutes claim and what constitutes evidence, right? So let's give you a quick example here. All right, if I were to say that Andrew Jackson, right, former president, the guy on the $20 bill, mm -hmm. 
displayed racist attitudes towards Native Americans Is that a claim or evidence? This is a claim, absolutely, right? This is a pretty big thing to say about somebody without sufficient evidence to back it up, right? This is a claim. If I wanted, to, if I wanted you to believe this, I would have to provide some verifiable data, right? So, if I were to say, if you remove the Cherokee and other southeastern tribes, from their lands and replace them with white settlers. Is that a claim or is that evidence? That's evidence, right? This is historically verifiable fact, right? This is a thing that happened. Now, I would probably have to compile more data than this to justify so large a claim, right? I would have to show that it was part of a consistent pattern of behavior on Jackson's part. But, we see how these things are related, right? Now, one thing that you are typically going to have to do with any piece of, with any sort of claim and evidence is explain what the logical link is between them. which is not always as clear to your reader as it is to you, right? Most pieces of evidence can be interpreted in multiple ways, right? So there are ways to interpret this piece of evidence that would not involve direct racism per se, right? And might involve, say, economic motives um, or, you know, <clears throat> other kinds of conflicts. So what you would need to demonstrate to your reader is why this particular piece of evidence justifies this particular claim, right? You've got to provide that logical link. This is one of the reasons I wanted you to do the enthymeme exercise, is because that forces you to think about these logical links, these implied links. Okay, so let's try a couple more of these. I'll give you a couple more examples. Uh, you pick them apart for me. So this one, is from a book by George Orwell. Um, how many of you have read Orwell? Did any of you read 1984 Animal Farm in high school? Okay, that's a good bit of you. Okay, so this is from a book called The Road to Wigan Pier. Um, and this book is, um, it's a nonfiction book, and it's observations that he made from traveling among coal miners in the north of England in the 1930s at a time of economic depression. All right, so first statement. Middle class people are fond of saying that the miners wouldn't bathe or wouldn't wash themselves properly even if they could, but this is nonsense. And then our statement which follows, where pithead bats exist, that is bats that are right at uh, the mine, practically all the men use them. What's the claim and what's the evidence? Okay. Why do you think the first? What's the what's the giveaway that the first one is the claim? 
What makes it obvious that the first one is a claim? It says that people, they're fond of saying, would that be kind of... Okay, that's one know? of those fuzzy kind of feeling words, right? What's that? Like by saying saying, it makes it hearsay. Okay, but what, what about this little tag at the end here, right, this last clause? But this is nonsense. This is his own personal opinion. Right, yeah, he's saying that's just that, yeah, that they're not, the claim he's making, right, is that their opinion is wrong, right? So that makes this a little bit tricky. But yeah, it is the claim. And the giveaway is that he says that what these middle class people are saying is nonsense. Right, what he wants you to believe is what they're, what, that what they're saying is dumb. Um, and what's the evidence then? That they Yeah, that he's seen the miners use the baths that are provided for them, right? So, good. All right, this next one is from an essay by the cultural critic Walter Benjamin. It's called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. All right, so sentence one. The Greeks knew only two procedures of technically reproducing works of art. Founding and standing. Second sentence Mechanical reproduction of a work of art represents something new. What's the claim and what's the evidence? Okay. Why is the claim the second one? Because like the first one is just the first one is just like a fact. He's saying that they only did two types. The second one, he's saying that like his own personal opinion, not his own personal opinion, but it is an opinion or a claim. Like he's saying that. It's yeah. Opinion. This is so he said. Okay. So I've observed right that these ancient peoples only knew ways of physically and laboriously reproducing individual works of art, right? Founding and stamping um, take a lot of more time and effort than running something through a machine and making multiple copies at once, right? So he concludes from this that mechanical reproduction of a work of art, right, using a machine to make multiple copies of a work of art is something new, is something that human beings have only just started doing, right? So this is, we kind of, kind of see evidence here again of an inductive process, right? Okay, I observe this piece of data, and this gets me thinking about a claim, right? All right, let's try one more of these, and then we'll move on to something slightly different. All right. This is from a book by the psychoanalyst and um, anti-colonial uh, demonstrator, uh, France Fanon called Black Skin, White Masks. So in the French colonial army, black officers served first of all as interpreters. The colonized is elevated above his status in proportion to his adoption of the mother country's cultural standards. What's the claim and what's the evidence? The 
Okay, why would you say why would you say the second one is the claim, Garrett? Okay, um, are the, is it the colonized who are of higher status than the people from the mother country? If you are someone who lives in a colonized country, say a colony of France, and you want to get ahead in the French colonial army, well, what is the saying you have to do? If you're, say, from Senegal, and you want to get ahead in the French colonial army, do you have to act more Senegalese, or do you have to act more French? Yeah, the claim here is that if you want to get ahead in a structure dominated by the colonizing country, right, then you have to act like the colonizer does. And so the piece of evidence here, right, is that black soldiers get to become officers if they speak good French and can translate for the French officers, right? So that's the logical link here between this claim and this evidence, right? Is that it's about adoption of the cultural standards of someone else's country, right? Okay, so there is a way that we can test a little bit more specifically for some of these logical links that I'm talking about. There's a method of argumentation that focuses on establishing links between claim and evidence. It's typically referred to as the Toulmin model. of argumentation, right? Named for its inventor, um, a philosopher of language by the name of Stephen Toulmin. So Toulmin breaks arguments up into six distinct parts. We're going to be using a simplified version of his model that only breaks an argument down into three parts, right? The first part is the claim, right? The thing of which you are trying to convince someone else. The second part, Toulmin calls the grounds. This is basically the same as what we call evidence. This is the verifiable fact that is meant to back up the claim. And the third, Part Toulmin call, uh, calls a warrant, right? So what is a warrant? Like if, if the cops show up at your house with a warrant, right? What does that warrant provide? Yeah, it provides a reason why they're allowed to do something they're not normally allowed to do, right? They're not normally allowed to come in and search your house without your permission. If they have a warrant, this says okay. You're, they're allowed to come in. There's, there's cause for them to come in, right? So a warrant is that cause for linking the grounds to the claim. Right? So just think of it that way. Okay, so this first example, I'm going to preface, preface this by saying that I know absolutely nothing about baseball except that one guy throws a ball and another guy hits it with a stick. Um, so I am going solely based on, you know, what my father's favorite team was when I was a kid, right? I have no idea if this team is actually any good or has any shot at the World Series. So please, you know, keep the mockery uh, to a minimum if you're a baseball <laughs> fan. Okay. So the claim I'm going to make here is that the Tigers will win the World Series this year. And my grounds for this, again, I have no idea whether this is actually true or not. 
is that they have the best pitching staff in the league. Which was true when I was eight. That was a long time ago. All right, so what's the warrant here? What's the logical link? Having a dominant pitching staff and the World Series. Yes. That the team that wins the World Series will be the team with the best pitching staff, right? Right, that, <clears throat> pitch, that good pitching is what wins baseball games, basically. Okay. Let's try another one here. All right. I'm going through customs, coming back from a trip, um, say, to Canada. I go to Canada a lot. And <clears throat> I make the claim simply by getting in a particular line coming through the airport to get my stuff checked and my passport checked. That I am a US citizen, right? This means that when I'm coming back from another country, I get to get through the I get to go through the expedited line, right? Good for me. My grounds for making this claim is that I was born in Pennsylvania. So what's the warrant that links the claim in the grounds here? Okay. Pennsylvania is in the United States and any person born in the United States is considered a citizen. Yes. Anyone born in the US is considered a citizen, right? So Now there are other grounds I could use to make the same claim, right? For if both my parents were citizens, right? Then I'm automatically a citizen, so on and so forth, right? But we see how this works, right? This is the logical link between the claim and the evidence here. All right. Just a couple more here. All right, so the next Democratic Party convention will probably be in Charlotte. Again, have no idea if this is true. I think they've already had one in Charlotte, but um, just bear with me. My grounds for this is that the party needs to win North Carolina. So what would be my warrant for connecting this claim to this grounds? Yeah, you should hold your convention, right? In a state that you need to win. Right, a party should hold its convention One more, and then we're going to try this. We're going to try something else. This is something that would be a little bit closer to an argument you might see in a more academic source, right? We've been sort of taking daily life examples here. This is something that would be closer to something you would see in an academic article or that somebody might write in a paper. Okay. 
So our claim is that Beowulf, the Anglo-Saxon poem, not the shitty animated movie, which is a bloody travesty, shows a culture in transition from warrior-focused paganism to Christianity. Have any of you ever actually read Beowulf and you have to read it in high school or just read it for shits and giggles? No one reads it for shits and giggles, huh? But you read it for shits and giggles. No, no, for I thought. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, but not the whole thing. Okay. All right, just curious. All right, my grounds for making this claim that the poem includes sympathetic portrayals of pagan warriors and celebrations of their battles alongside warnings against pagan practices. The fun things about that poem is every time a character does something cool, it's like a monk comes in and starts wagging his fingers, but that's naughty. All right, so what's my warrant for connecting this ground to this claim? What would justify using this as evidence to support this? What would I have to believe about literature generally to connect this claim to this grounds? What do I have to think literature or art does? It's a statement. About what? <laughs> okay, I mean, along those lines, yeah, right. Essentially, what I would have to believe, right, the warrant that I would need here. is that art and culture reflect conflicts in a given society, right? OK, so any questions about how this works, right? So what I, what I want you to do with this, right, in general, when you are reading any kind of argumentative writing or doing any argumentative writing, always make sure that your reason for connecting a particular claim to a particular piece of evidence is made clear to your reader, right? You're always going to want to include that warrant when you're connecting claim and evidence because it's not always going to be immediately clear to your reader what you mean or how you're connecting these two things, right? And because particular pieces of evidence can be interpreted in multiple ways, you need to make sure that you are insulating yourself against somebody coming and saying, well, what about blah, right? Okay, so in practical terms, when you're writing, you don't want a paragraph that is all evidence, and you don't want a paragraph that is all claim. Right? You want to make sure that every paragraph you write makes at least one main claim, which should come at the beginning of the paragraph. And probably a balance of about one-third claim, two-thirds evidence is usually going to be, usually going to be good. Right? You don't want to be too claim heavy or too evidence heavy. Now you also want to make sure that the things that you're using as evidence are actually evidence. 
I'm going to give you an example here uh, from a student paper I got several semesters ago. I'm pretty sure that the student um, I got this from has since graduated. Um, pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. You, you won't be able to identify him anyway. Right. Or her. Um, so. <clears throat> Uh, what was it? Um, states and cities should require all citizens to own firearms. The city of Kennesaw. passed a law requiring citizens to own guns. And it worked out great. So what mistaken reasoning has been made here? opinion as evidence for a claim? Yeah, these are both claims, right? This student has taken a second claim and used it as evidence for the first claim. Now, what would he need to do in order to turn this into evidence? Yeah, he, exactly. He would have to provide some sort of comparison, right, for how things were in Kennesaw before the law was passed whether they improved after the law was passed, right? Say, did crime rates go down? Um, and could those changes be accounted for by other explanations, right? So there was a lot of work that this individual would have to do before he could say that the law worked out great, right? Again, like this is not meant to express any particular political opinion, right? This is just a good example of how we sometimes mis sort of naturalize our own opinions and assumptions and think that things are evidence when they are actually claims, right? So always make sure when you are using something as evidence that you can actually go someplace to verify it, right? Can you look this up to see whether this is true or false? Okay, so what I'd like you to do now, right, I'm going to show you a short clip. Uh, it's a comedy sketch. And there are two characters. Each of them making a claim. So I want you to think about First, what the relationship is between the two characters. And what assumptions does that relationship carry, right? What do we assume about people who have this relationship to one another should behave towards one another? Secondly, I want you to look for binary oppositions in the sketch. Right? We've talked before about these paired opposites that can often tell us what issues are at stake in a particular piece that we're watching or reading. So look for those. And the main thing that has to do with today's work, right, is what claims does each character make against the other? What evidence do they provide to support these claims?
wish to register a complaint. Hello, miss. What do you mean, miss? No, I'm sorry, I have a cold. I wish to make a complaint. Oh, sorry, uh, we're closing for lunch. Never mind that, my lad. I wish to complain about this pallet. What I purchased not half an hour ago from this very boutique. Oh, yes, sir, uh, the Norwegian Blue. What's wrong with it? I'll tell you what's wrong with it, my lad. It's dead. That's what's wrong with it. No, no, I say, it's resting, look. Look, my lad, I know a dead pallet when I see one, and I'm looking at one right now. No, that's not dead, it's uh, resting. Resting? Yeah, resting. Remarkable bird, the Norwegian Blue, isn't it? Beautiful plumage. The plumage didn't enter into it. It's still dead. Now it's resting. All right, then, if it's resting, I'll wake it up. Hello, body! I've got a nice fresh cuttlefish for you if you wake up, Mr. Polly Ballard! Dirty move. No, you didn't. That was you pushing the cage. I didn't. Yes, you did. Hello, body! Customer to shopkeeper, right? Okay. So you have a customer to shopkeeper. And so what assumptions are being made here about the relationship between a customer and a shopkeeper? Okay, what does that what does that mean functionally, right? If the, cust if the customer is always right. The shopkeeper aims to please the customer or satisfy their desires. Okay, okay, yes. So if the shopkeeper is supposed to keep the customer happy, right, then if you happen to purchase faulty merchandise from a shopkeeper, what are they supposed to do for you? Replace it. Yeah, they're supposed to replace it with something of equal value, right, or give you your money back. And what's not happening in this scene? 
Yeah, the shopkeeper is finding all kinds of ways to avoid having to make any kind of restitution to the customer, right? The humor in the scene largely dodges from the sh uh, usually uh, largely results from the shopkeeper's attempts to dodge having to give the customer what he legally deserves, right? And you know anybody who's ever worked in customer service knows that the, the real purpose of customer service is not to serve the customer, right? The purpose is loss prevention. I, I used to, in a previous life, I worked uh, online customer service for WeightWatchers.com, which was its own special kind of hell. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, like, you know, my basic directive was don't give anybody any refunds, right? Find ways to not give people refunds. So one could argue that what's going on here is that the sketch is demonstrating the way in which the customer shopkeeper relationship really works, right? You only give the customer a refund as an absolute last resort if there is nothing you can do to get them to leave you alone. So what features do we notice attached to each of these? What's the customer like? What do we notice about the customer? What qualities do we associate here with the customer? Pardon? Yeah, he spends a good bit of the sketch shouting, right? He was, after all, sold a dead parrot. What other qualities do we associate with the customer? He's persistent. Okay, very persistent. All right, he continues complaining until he almost gets what he wants. What else? What do we notice about him that might be a little bit different from the shopkeeper? Taller. Okay, yeah. <laughs> He's tall. The shopkeeper is short. Do you notice any difference in the way they talk? Their yeah, their accents are different, right? Which of the two of them sounds more posh and educated? The yeah, the customer has a slightly higher status accent, right? And his vocabulary is more advanced too, right? But is he other words for dead? Yeah, he knows so many different synonyms for dead, right? Some of them really creative, like run down the curtain and join the choir invisible, right? This is an ex parrot. So yeah, so the the customer has a posh accent and advanced vocabulary. The shopkeeper seems to keep reusing the same words, right? He has a more limited vocabulary and his accent is a little bit more working class. Especially, you know, one thing, one giveaway there, at least when you're, if you watch a lot of English, a lot of British television, you notice that people of lower status will often call people of higher status things like governor or squire. <laughs> and he refers to this guy as squire, right? What else do we notice with the shopkeeper? Okay, yeah. The customer's assertive and persistent. The shopkeeper is evasive, but he's also persistent, right? Pardon? Yeah. He is persistent in his lie, right? This is another difference between the two. The customer is telling the truth. The parrot is dead. Whereas everything the shopkeeper says is a lie. How can we tell right from the beginning that the shopkeeper is basically full of shit? What does he call the parrot? Is it a Norwegian blue? A Norwegian blue, right? Yeah. yeah, now, are parrots native to Norway? No. No, yeah, parrots do not live in Scandinavia. Scandinavia is very cold. 
They do not live in Norway. They do not pine for the fjords, right? They're tropical birds. So we can tell from the moment he opens his mouth about the parrot that he's lying, that he doesn't really know anything about parrots, and he's just making shit up. OK, other, um, well, what's the claim each of these men is making? One says it's dead, one says it's not. OK, that's sort of, yeah, the obvious surface level claim, right? The customer is saying the parrot is dead. The shopkeeper is saying, no, it's just resting. And what's the claim then that underlies each of those surface claims? The shopkeeper will do anything that he can to not give money back to the customer. Yeah. The customer is saying, you should give me my money back. That's his claim. Customer's claim is give me my money back. Shopkeeper's claim is no way. I'm keeping your money. And indeed, does the customer provide any evidence that the parrot didn't die after he took it out of the shop? Yeah, he said it was nailed. Yeah. The mere fact of the parrot being dead is not sufficient evidence that he deserves his money back, right? Any number of things could have happened to that parrot in the half hour since the customer left the shop, right? The customer could have killed the parrot himself. The parrot could have simply, you know, gotten, you know, you know, caught a sudden flu and passed away, right? At any rate, like, it's not obviously, immediately, the shopkeeper's fault that the parrot is dead. But the evidence that the customer piles up, right? You know, one, what position was the, was the parrot in um, when he bought it? Yeah, lying flat on its back, right? Totally motionless, which the shopkeeper assured him was due to its just being tired and the Norwegian blue preferring lying down, right? Which is true of no parrot at all, right? Um, <clears throat> now, the other issue, yeah, is the fact that the parrot's feet were clearly nailed to the perch, right? Do any of you have any experience with parrots? Okay, a little bit. Is a parrot gonna let you get up there and put nails in its feet? God, no, a live parrot is not going to let that happen, right? Um, I used to play um, in a band, and at the rehearsal space uh, that we rented, the owner had a parrot named Mikey that he kept there. And Mikey was this vicious and foul-tempered bird, right, that if you came anywhere near his cage, he would try to take your fingers off. Um, part of this might have been that he lived in a rehearsal space used by bands, um, and so it was just hearing noise all the time. But yeah, a live parrot, if you, try to, if you try to get close to its cage and hurt it, it's gonna fight back, right? So the evidence is all on the side of the customer here, right? And what's the shopkeeper's strategy for not giving the customer what he deserves? Just keep deflecting the argument. Constantly deflect, right? Constantly evade, in fact, how does he end up defeating the customer's superior argument? Changing the subject. Completely changes the subject and walks into a different sketch, right? Says, nope, now I'm a lumberjack. <laughs> takes, off his, takes off his coat and walks out of the scene, right? So who wins in the exchange? The shopkeeper still wins in the exchange, right, despite the fact that the customer has truth and right on his side, right? So what's going on in this scene underneath the surface then that we might not be seeing immediately? We could probably come to some conclusions about that based on the set of evidence we've got here, right? We could make a few claims, perhaps, 
based on these differences between customer and shopkeeper. So if we look at their respective behavior, does the customer seem particularly sympathetic or likable? Now he's got the posh accent, right? And his behavior towards the shopkeeper, right? we've got a tall, we've got a tall man with a wealthier, more educated accent towering over a smaller man with a lower status accent and shouting at him, right? So that in itself makes the customer seem a little bit like a bully. Like he's trying to push this, like he's trying to push the shopkeeper around. And indeed, like, would it have been obvious to most of you that the parrot was dead before you bought it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's the idiot who bought a dead parrot in the first place, right? So clearly, posh accent or not, he's not all that clever. Whereas the shopkeeper, despite his inferior social status and inferior vocabulary, and the fact that he's wrong on the facts, still manages to get one over on the customer, right? The shopkeeper still wins. So we could make a claim about this sketch, right? This you know, might be the beginning of a thesis if we were to you know, write, say, a short paper about this. That you know, while the customer clearly has facts and evidence on his side, his aggressive demeanor and demanding behavior make the audience sympathize with the shifty shopkeeper. And you know, if we did a little bit more investigation into the scene, then this preliminary thesis might not quite hold up, right? But what I've done here, right, is a demonstration of inductive reasoning. We've laid out a set of observable data from the scene and come to a conclusion about it, right, that we could then use as the basis for an argument. And you know, this will lead us into the next couple of class sessions when we're going to be talking about how to construct and advance a thesis, right? how to generate a thesis statement from a set of data. So does anybody have any questions about any of this? Anybody have any questions about tonight's homework? It's going to be your last homework assignment for um, a couple of sessions, right? You're still going to be reading chapter five in the book for next time and chapter six for next Tuesday, but there, there aren't any um, attached homework assignments with those. All right, then I will let you go a little bit early today. All right, go. Hope the weather's nice. Frolic in the fields. Do whatever it is young people do. And we'll see you on Thursday.